Welcome to Hot Chips 2023. Keynote 1. Exciting directions for ML models and the implications for computing hardware. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Jeff Dean and Amin Vadad, who will be giving the first keynote. Probably both of them don't require introduction, but I will tell you about them anyway. So Jeff joined Google uh, at 2000, uh, sorry, 1999, and uh, he's been working and contributing and helping to build uh, Google's uh, early products. I think you might have heard about many of them, so things like uh, Google Tables and uh, MapReduce and, and, and Spanner uh, has been all uh, benefited by contributions from Jeff. For the past decade, he has focused on uh, large-scale distributed deep learning and I think always been upfront at the edge of the largest models and infrastructure to train those models. So he was uh, one of the main authors uh, uh, behind this belief. That's one of the first things that enabled us to train very large neural networks, and uh, he's also worked on TensorFlow and Pathway software uh, that's uh, been used to train one of the largest uh, models, uh, Palm, um, of today. Uh, he also was part of the early efforts on TPU hardware, um, and again, work across hardware and software uh, on deep learning. Jeff co-founded the Google Brain team and the Google Research Organization and led Google Research for many years. Um, and uh, he's currently chief scientist, focusing mostly on um, AI uh, with a deep mind and Google research. And he co-lead the Gemini project, uh, which has been talked a lot in uh, certain circles, but nobody knows what exactly they're doing. So <laughs> looking forward to learn more about that. Um, now uh, to Amin. Uh, Amin is a fellow and uh, vice president of engineering at Google. Um, his team is responsible for machine learning software and hardware at Google. Um, in the past, he was a general manager uh, for Google's compute storage and network uh, organization and uh, until 2019 was technical lead for networking organization at Google. Before joining Google, um, Amin was a professor of computer science uh, and engineering at UC uh, San Diego. And uh, over the past years, uh, he has been awarded uh, many different awards. And it's a true honor to have him here on stage together with Jeff. So unfortunately, Jeff wasn't able to come in person. Uh, and it was not the case until the last moment. Uh, so Amin here is in person and Jeff will be presenting online. And with that, uh, let me welcome both uh, Jeff and Amin and looking forward to hear what they, what they have to say. Watching this kind of hand off slide back and forth. All right, so what we're going to talk to you today about is exciting directions for ML models and the implications for computing hardware. Um, a couple of observations. So obviously in recent years, machine learning has really changed our expectations of what we think of as being possible with computers. Um, computers can now sort of understand imagery, understand speech, understand language much better than they ever used to be able to. And that opens up an exciting set of new possibilities. Um, another observation is that increasing scale, uh, using more co computation, more data, making larger models, delivers better results. And the kinds of computations we want to run, the hardware we want to run them on, is changing dramatically. Um, so I think that's an important lesson for computer hardware designers is we need to sort of be able to uh, roll with the improving uh, ML research landscape. Okay, so there's been a decade of amazing progress in what we think of computers as being able to do through uh, use of deep learning. Um, and here's some examples of problems that deep learning has really tackled and made significant advances on in the past decade. You know, image classification where you take the pixels of an image and you generate an output of a categorical label like leopard, or speech recognition where you take audio waveforms and produce you know, a transcript of what's being said. Um, you know, translation where you take uh, sentences or documents in one language and produce them in another. And even like taking the pixels of an image and instead of outputting categorical labels, outputting a short description of, of that image. Uh, you know, a cheetah lying on top of a car. 
Um, but more interestingly, perhaps, is in the last few years, we've been able to reverse many of these things. So we can now take as input things that we want in sort of textual form, like leopard here, and have the model actually generate you know, hundreds of different images of, of leopards that are, you know, uh, realistic looking and quite plausible. Uh, obviously, being able to go from text to speech is sort of a uh, speech synthesis system. Uh, it's not too surprising to be able to reverse uh, translation, uh, but it is perhaps a bit surprising to be able to take like a sentence description of an image that you would like and then generate images uh, that have kind of the characteristics of the uh, scene description there. So I think this is a pretty exciting uh, set of capabilities that has really emerged in the last, you know, four or five years. Uh, similarly, there's been a lot of progress on uh, sort of conversational systems where you can have interactive discussions with the system and it can sort of give you, you know, uh, back and forth uh, that is in many cases quite helpful. So here, for example, uh, bard.google.com is a product that we've uh, recently launched that enables conversations to happen uh, where you can sort of talk about many different things. Here I've uh, said, can you please reverse the letters of hot chips and tensor processing unit for me? Maybe that's a task I'm going to do and it's kind of complicated. I'd rather the computer do it than I have to do it. And Bard's response is, sure, here are the reverse strings. But perhaps more interestingly, it said, hey, I can do this for you in Python. Here's the code. And it generated, you know, plausible and correct looking Python code. And, you know, can describe the code down here, uh, what it's actually doing. And then it, uh, you know, uses the Python code to actually accomplish this task. And then says, helpfully, is there anything else I can help you with? Um, so that's, that's pretty cool. Like, you can imagine this being a really great educational tool for people who are starting to learn uh, to program. Um, you know, there's all kinds of opportunities here. Um, similarly, then I can continue and say, tell me more about TPUs. And the system will respond with, you know, not output that exists on the web, but a synthesized version of things that it's been able to learn through its training process about TPUs. And it says, you know, TPUs are specialized hardware processors developed by Google to accelerate machine learning. They can help improve the performance and efficiency. And this is all kind of a interactive uh, generative conversational model, which we think is a pretty interesting direction for this kind of work. <clears throat> um, there's been pretty significant advances in being able to then take these general models and then fine tune them for different kinds of tasks. So MedPalm1 was a uh, system that we took the Palm1 mo language model and fine tuned it on medical data and uh, then asked it to perform uh, a medical entrance exam, uh, sorry, a medical board exam, and 60% is a passing mark, and Palm 1 achieved a 67% score. And then six months later, we did the same kind of thing on a more sophisticated language model, uh, and we got an 86.5% score. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity in uh, tuning domain-specific models, uh, starting with general purpose models. And similarly, uh, rather than just text, we care a lot about different kinds of mo uh, multimodal models where you can take different modalities, you know, images, text, uh, speech, uh, language as input, code as input, or produce any of those as output. So Pali enables us to take images and a description of what we want uh, the system to do, generate the alt text in English, and it says a baseball player with the number 29 in his back, uh, Imagine sort of takes these textual descriptions below the image and can produce like really nice looking images like this, which is a pretty fantastic uh, creative and generative tool. <clears throat> All right, so in the rest of the talk, uh, I want to talk about some important trends in machine learning model, some implications for computer architects, and how do we design ML hardware and deploy it quickly in order to keep up with the fast moving field. So Mean and I will address these issues. And really what we want to ask is what is it going to take to deliver major increases in compute capacity and efficiency to continue to advance the field of ML? Okay, so let's talk about a few important trends in machine learning models, sparsity, adaptive computation, and dynamically changing neural networks. So dense models, which are probably the neural nets you're most familiar with, are ones where the whole model is activated for every input example or for every token uh, that is uh, generated. And it's the focus of the vast majority of the machine learning community. 
Um, while they're great and they've been able to achieve lots of great things, um, sparse computation is going to be an important trend in the future. Sparse models have different pathways that are sort of adaptively called upon as needed. And so rather than having this giant model, these sparse models can be much more efficient. They sort of just call upon the right pieces of the overall model. Uh, and the right pieces aspect is also something that is learned during the training process. Uh, different parts of the model can then be specialized for different kinds of inputs. And the end result is you end up with something where you touch just the right 1% or the right 10% of some very large model. And this gives you both improved responsiveness and higher accuracy because you now have a much larger model capacity than you could afford to train otherwise, uh, and then can call upon the right parts. Um, a bit of a side note, there's many different levels of sparsity. There's coarse grain sparsity, which you can think of as like very large modules that are either activated or not on a given example. Uh, and then there's fine grain sparsity, which is kind of sparsity within a single vector or tensor where perhaps one or two typically of every four values are zero. And modern hardware is starting to support this. Um, these two kinds of sparsity are actually complementary. You can have coarse grain modules that they themselves have fine grain sparsity within the activations or within the, the weight uh, parameter space. Um, so I don't think of them as mutually exclusive. You actually want to be able to exploit sparsity at many different levels. So most sparsity work today uses the same size and structure for each expert. So you have some set of green experts here, four of them. Uh, you have some learned routing function here that learns which expert is good at which kind of thing. And then you send uh, some of the examples to the appropriate expert. And computational balance is typically achieved by having equal size computation per expert and equal flow of the number of examples to each expert. Um, for computer architects, this means that all-to-all -all shuffle performance across accelerators is really important. Uh, this is true for sort of all sparse models. You want to be able to sort of quickly route things from one part of the model to the other um, in the right ways. Um, one thing you might want to be able to do, though, is instead of having fixed computational costs, is to vary the computational cost of different pieces of the model. Um, there's no point in spending the same amount of compute on every example, because some examples are 100 times as hard, and we should be spending 100 times as much computation on things that are really difficult as on things that are very simple. And so here you see we've got uh, a very tiny expert of you know very small amount of computation that perhaps is, could be used for 90% of the examples because they're simple. And then you have a, progressively seri a progressive series of larger and larger experts that maybe are specialized for different kinds of things. This one may be specialized for very difficult situations uh, of a particular flavor. And those don't get much traffic, but there are a lot of computation. Uh, they might even have very different kinds of computational structures. So one might be a very simple, you know, one layer piece of a model, whereas the more complex thing might have many, many layers itself. <clears throat> and that in order to map all this onto hardware, you want to be able to map the larger, more computationally expensive things onto more chips. So this one might be on 16 chips, this one might be on eight chips, and these two might be on one chip. Um, one of the things we've been working on for the past few years is a system called Pathways, which is a scalable system to enable these kinds of flexible machine learning models. So we have a flexible mapping of components, which you can think of as pieces of the ML computation, the little green or blue squares, uh, rectangles from the previous slides, onto a collection of physical computational devices. And you can then dynamically add or remove resources, like more physical hardware to the running system, and the system will deal with it. Uh, and Pathways also manages com communication across multiple kinds of network transports and chooses the appropriate and fastest one uh, for you know, any sort of uh, communication that needs to be done by the higher level uh, software. And it's highly scalable. The Palm language model was trained across uh, multiple TPU v4 pods using Pathways, where within one pod, the ICI, the inter -chip interconnect, which is a very high bandwidth network, is used, and then as you go across uh, pod boundaries, data center network transfers are used in order to communicate between one side of the model and the other. <laughs> Another thing that I think is going to be increasingly important is dynamically introducing new model capacity. You might start out with a sparse model that looks something like that, but then you want to sort of add some sort of new task and uh, ask the model to then be able to accomplish this new task, which might involve introducing a new module 
new path, new parameters, uh, maybe initialized from somewhere else or maybe randomly initialized and then sort of be able to deal with this. And you might want to be able to do this kind of uh, quite a number of different times. And that's going to mean the structure of the model kind of changes and, and grows over time. <clears throat> so I think there's a few trends that are really important to highlight here. One is, you know, we've basically moved away from separate models for different tasks, which was what was mostly happening in the machine learning community, say, uh, five years ago to uh, before that, um, into a, a world where we now have single models that can generalize across many, many tasks. Um, we're starting to move away from dense models into more efficient sparse models. I don't think that transition is really complete, but it's a really important trend to keep, uh, keep track of, especially as people think about designing computer hardware. Um, and we're moving away from single modality models into models that can deal with any modality and deal with many modalities, both as inputs and as outputs, images, text, audio, um, video, code. You want to be able to input all those and produce all those with any subset of them as inputs or outputs. So the key takeaways for computer architects and system builders, I think, is that the connectivity of accelerators, bandwidth and latency, really matters because you're definitely going to be using many, many chips in order to sort of uh, train these larger models and therefore making them work effectively as a connected set of components is really important. Scale matters for both training and inference. Uh, sparse models put pressure on memory capacity and efficient routing. Uh, the ML software that sits above all this must make it really easy to express interesting models that are not just purely regular dense computations. And power, sustainability, and reliability really matter. Um, I'd like to take a quick detour around uh, talking about uh, CO2 emissions of machine learning training. Uh, this is an area that's got lots of attention and has lots of dramatic headlines. Uh, unfortunately, it's rife with uh, misinformation, uh, but it's a really important topic, and it's critical to use actual data to focus on the right things, I believe. So let me give you an example. Um, there's a, a quite high, highly cited paper called Energy and Policy Considerations for Deep Learning in NLP uh, that was published in 2019 that attempted to estimate the CO2 emissions of an evolved transformer neural architecture search uh, run by SOIL. So unlike other data in the uh, Struble et al. paper, this uh, estimate was estimated, not actually measured. And so they actually modeled a P100, not the TPU V2, uh, uh, computational device where the computation was actually run. They used a U.S. data center uh, uh, sort of energy footprint uh, PUE and not a Google data center. And so the actual search uh, was five times lower as a result of this. But they also kind of assumed the use of a full-size model, not a small proxy size model for the search, despite that being described and so at all. And so the actual search was 19 times less computed emissions due to this error. And they also misunderstood that a neural architecture search is a one-time cost to find a new kind of model architecture that can be used for many problems, not at every problem cost. And as a result of these, they arrived at this flawed estimate of 284 tons of CO2e for the evolved transformer NAS. Um, obviously, this is a big number, and so people got very excited and generated lots and lots of exciting news headlines. You may have seen training a single AI model can emit as much carbon as five cars in their lifetime. Um, but it's all based on flawed estimates. So fortunately, if you ha use correct data, things are not nearly so dire. So first, the actual ne neural architecture search done by So et al. Uh, generated 3.2 tons of carbon, not 284 tons. That's 88 times less. Um, the discovered evolved transformer model was is a drop-in replacement for the plane transformer and uses 16 to 25% less energy to reach the same accuracy. So it actually saves carbon emissions for downstream uses, and it's open source for everyone to use. And it's a one-time search, not a every problem search. And if you use that model, uh, training an NLP model at the scale examined by Struble et al, using this discovered transformer on ML-efficient hardware and a Google data center, uh, takes about 120 TPU v2 hours, costs $40, and generates 2.4 kilograms of CO2e, not 284 tons metric tons. That's 118,000 times less. This is roughly the carbon emissions of producing a liter of milk. 
uh, which is quite different than five car lifetime CO2s. All right, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Amin to talk more about uh, efficiency metrics and what we should be thinking about. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, I think everyone can hear me in the room. Uh, it's a real privilege for me to be here and also to have the opportunity to present uh, to you all with uh, Jeff. So transitioning to this portion of the talk, you heard about some of the amazing motivation, some of the real transformation that's taking place across um, our communities, but also really uh, it's not an uh, overstatement to say society-wide. Uh, if there's probably one thing I want to get across to you all in this portion of the talk is that uh, to meet the needs of the community, to rise to meet the challenges ahead of us in um, meeting the opportunities around Gen AI, we have to change how we think about system design end-to-end. -end. So what I'd like to convey is that we need to look at system good put, power, reliability, and carbon dioxide equivalents as primary benchmarking and design targets. If we're not accounting for these four end-to-end, -end, uh, we're not going to build the right systems uh, to meet the challenges ahead of us. Jeff talked about uh, a lot of different uh, innovations that are taking place in modeling. Uh, still, the rise in computing demand over the past, let's say, five, six, seven years has been stunning. Right? This graph shows from public sources the number of dense parameter uh, models, uh, model parameters that we have just sort of across the community. It's not a Google number, it's uh, across the board. And while, again, lots of innovations are coming to take advantage of sparsity, when you're looking at this graph, it shows 10x a year sustained in the number of parameters per model. And we also know that the computation costs grow super linearly with the number of parameters. Right? So the kind of computing infrastructure that we have to build to meet this challenge has to change. And I think that it's really important to note that we would not be where we are today if we try to do this on general purpose compute. In other words, really the conventional wisdom that we've developed over the past, really, 50, 60 years uh, has been thrown out the window. And that has been, over the past 50 or 60 years, general purpose compute is going to get fast enough, quickly enough, that it can rise to meet the needs of all kinds of computations. I think it's fair to say that uh, at Google, and but more importantly across the community, machine learning cycles are going to be taking up an increasing fraction of what we're looking to do. So uh, we've uh, changed. We've adapted to uh, meet this challenge. I'm going to be telling you about uh, TPUs. That's uh, what uh, I know best. That's what the team knows best. But I would note that the same kind of innovations have really applied across the board, certainly with uh, GPUs and uh, many related uh, hardware offerings. So uh, I won't go through the details of everything on this slide, um, but I think it's important to note that we've really thrown conventional wisdom out the window. And through these, over the past few years, we've delivered 10 to perhaps 100x improvements in system efficiency when accounting for performance, power, and cost. With uh, TPUs, just some of the things that we've done is we've built a synchronous high bandwidth interconnect that essentially connect the computing units directly to one another. For the first time in uh, my memory, we're not going with a general purpose interconnect, uh, such as Ethernet, to build out a computing infrastructure. We've moved away from air cooling to liquid cooling, really focusing on power efficiency. Uh, we've adopted specialized data representations, not standard integer and floating point uh, models anymore. We've, for the first time, moved from electrical packet switching to optical circuit switching to connect our very large computers together and manage the reliability requirements. Uh, we've put in substantial specialized hardware to uh, handle scatter-gather operations for increasing sparsity, but also for the dense matrix multiplications that still dominate much of the computes. And we've moved from DRAM to high bandwidth memory, stacked essentially on top of the computes for much lower latency and much higher bandwidth to essentially feed the computational infrastructures. So across the board, where we've wound up as a community, I highlight the TPU model. Same things apply uh, across the board to other hardware architectures. Uh, we've now wound up with a computing system that looks radically different than what general purpose compute would have led us to uh, had we not had the real machine learning demands and the revolution that we've seen over the past few years. Uh, at Google, we've iterated over the past uh, eight years on our TPU architecture, starting with our TPU v1 that was really targeting inference uh, internally. We moved to uh, TPU v2 that was really our first uh, supercomputer offering that delivered the high bandwidth interconnect and allowed hundreds of chips to communicate with one another. 
asynchronously operating on single problems. Uh, to TPU v3, uh, most recently, we've announced the TPU v4 a couple of years ago. This consists of 4,096 TPUs across uh, uh, 64 racks, all operating potentially on single large-scale problems. Jeff highlighted the uh, work that we've done to actually, at a software level, even scale beyond individual TPUs. So even 4,096 hasn't been quite enough <clears throat> excuse me, to go after the largest scale problems that, that we're interested in going after. Uh, I'll also note that tomorrow is the kickoff for uh, uh, Google Cloud Next, uh, so you might learn more about our TPU roadmap there. Okay, so amazing progress, uh, really over the past, uh, let's say, almost decade in accelerated computing. Perhaps more than a factor of 100 relative to the baseline, even with the rapid improvements in general purpose compute, we've been able to stay ahead of that as a community. And really some of the breakthroughs that you've seen over the past year that are capturing the imagination uh, of everyone has really been enabled by this factor of 100 acceleration over what otherwise would have been possible. Uh, really amazing. In other words, where we are today is driven by our ability to um, take on problems that really would have been unimaginable a decade ago, both in terms of computational capability and also the data that we're able to ingest and operate on. Right? The, the scale of the computing that is being run essentially every day is really, really mind-boggling. However, what we've done to date is no longer going to be sufficient. In other words, you saw the um, trends that we're seeing, a factor of 10 increase every year in dense parameters per model. We're going to uh, drive that down in terms of computational requirements through tremendous innovation that's going to happen on the model side. But uh, on the path that we're on, we're not going to be able to keep up with the computational needs of the community. So while we must continue with the accelerated computing roadmap that we all have, it's not going to be sufficient. So we're going to need easily another 100x over the baseline. In other words, to keep these trends going, we're going to have to take on more. This will uh, happen across the board. We're going to need the uh, next generation of horizontal scaling. We're going to need to continue our algorithmic innovation, our software innovation, compilers one time and more. Here, though, in this presentation, I'm going to focus on optimizing for system good put, on power, on reliability, and carbon dioxide. Uh, equivalence in emissions. So the problem with current metrics, the way that we, um, all of us, look at uh, how well we're doing is that uh, we look at headline numbers like chip performance as a numerator and cost or dollars as a denominator. And we do this subject to a fixed power budget. So one thing to note here is that higher power is okay as long as it meets reliability and heat dissipation requirements, and as long as it can be air-cooled in some physical space consideration. <coughs> Chip performance is often a simplistic view of headline numbers, and these headline numbers might be, let's say, spec-int for a CPU. They might be maximum flops for uh, accelerated computing. In general, though, these metrics say nothing about the performance of the computation that we run on the system. This becomes increasingly complex when we note that today these computations are running synchronously across hundreds or thousands of individual chips. So the max flops, let's say, of a particular chip is not that interesting if it doesn't translate to better good put or much better good put for a particular job. Uh, as an example, uh, and I'm inspired by uh, the adage that, uh, for better or worse, benchmarks shape a field, MLPerf, which is perhaps our primary benchmark that we leverage to compare the goodness uh, and the advances in our systems, really only focus on absolute performance at a given system size. MLPerf uh, results don't account for system cost. They don't account for carbon dioxide emissions or equivalents. Um, they don't uh, account for the efficiency of the system overall, and power is optional and typically not reported. So in other words, if we incentivize ourselves to focus on top-line performance at a given number of chips, we will wind up in the wrong place in terms of the massive aggregate computation capacity that we have to deliver in an affordable, uh, sustainable manner for the community. 
At Google, actually, uh, for um, many, many years, we've uh, tried to move past chip performance per dollar. Uh, we focused on system performance over TCO. Now, this, this is important uh, to spend a minute on. It's got a little bit of uh, simple math, but I, I do want to walk you through it. This is how we evaluate uh, the goodness of one system design, one architecture versus another. So the numerator tries to be benchmark performance, both current, but also projected out in the future. In other words, when we're looking at an architecture, we are really projecting a, 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 for something that's going to be in production, let's say, two or three years out, and that will then live in production for many, many years after that. So we have to be able to predict the future in terms of what workloads are going to be running on that architecture. That's what the numerator tries to capture. The denominator focuses on total cost of ownership. And that is not chip cost, that's system cost. In other words, the chip goes into a board, the board goes into an enclosure, it has memory. If it's an accelerator, it has compute associated with it, it has a network associated with it, optics, racks, data center, space and power. So total cost of ownership is not chip cost, it's the cost of the system that has to be built around it. So that's one component, that's the capital expenditures, all in. Equally important, is the operating expenditures, the OPEX associated with it. And that has uh, two portions. Right? One is data center provisioning costs. We have to have space and power built to house all this infrastructure. Uh, the other is um, electricity costs. So data center provisioning cost is proportional to the total dissipated power that we want to put in times the cost per provisioned watt. Now this is based on maximum power dissipation. We then also account for electricity cost, which is the consumed power, right? This is our bill to the utility in the end, times the dollar per consumed watt. So you can see, and one thing that's important to note is, let's say that I have a 10 megawatt data center and I have a um, chip that consumes a kilowatt. Now, let's not account for lots of other system components, networking, storage, maybe general purpose compute. But simplistically, with a kilowatt chip and a 10 megawatt data center, I can put 10,000 of those chips in that data center. However, the average power or the typical power that those chips consume might be much, much less. And that difference shows up as an important consideration. So uh, Perf TCO has some hidden assumptions and uh, room for improvement. And this is again why, why we at uh, Google are evolving our considerations. One important consideration is that it assumes there's enough data center capacity to house new compute. In other words, that it's available where and when we need it. And it has a fixed cost associated with that data center capacity. It also assumes that the consumed power for a workload can be accurately attributed back to individual workloads. In other words, it assumes that developers and users are incentivized to make their computation efficient relative to the capacity of the system. Finally, and this numerator part is very important, it assumes that our performance, systems performance, accurately captures the characteristics of both present and future workloads when accounting for reliability. Now, this reliability portion was somewhat less important for general purpose compute but we're seeing that it's actually becoming critical as we consider uh, machine learning workloads that are running synchronously across pot potentially thousands of individual compute nodes. So uh, I will argue that perf TCO, while in advance over chip uh, perf, chip headline perf over cost, is also no longer sufficient. Right? The assumptions have changed, the model has changed, and we need to evolve our metrics. So we can no longer assume that power capacity is infinite. Right? We want to be able to deploy our infrastructure all across the world, and we may or may not have access to large amounts of power in all locations. Further, we need our metrics to match the community's commitments to a carbon-free future. Right? Google, for example, has publicly committed to operate 24-7 carbon-free by the year 2030, a really ambitious goal. So what we want to advocate for is really looking at systems perf, per average watt, not per maximum watt for your system, and to hence encourage that we actually well utilize 
the capacity that's available to us. Second, we want to consider systems per, per carbon dioxide emissions or equivalents. And this really should account for their carbon dioxide equivalents for building a data center, for building the servers and accelerated compute that goes into that data center, and then the operational costs of powering all that over the lifetime of the infrastructure. Uh, let's uh, quickly go through some simple math to highlight why the carbon dioxide equivalence is so important. Based on public uh, sources, the cost to build a server is one to four tons of, of uh, carbon dioxide equivalents. The system to operate it is to build and deliver a server. Okay, and this is sheet metal, it's the board, it's the CPU, it's uh, other components. Also based on public sources, we know that uh, carbon dioxide offsets are about $1,000 a ton. If you got that same server consuming 1,000 watts max and 500 watts average over its lifetime, just again as a sample example, working through a six-year lifetime, that server would consume 26 megawatt hours, 26,000 kilowatt hours of power. And according to IEA, in a typical data center, that would be 12.5 metric tons. Multiplying through by $1,000 to get the carbon dioxide emissions offset, that would be $12,500 for the lifetime of the server to offset the carbon dioxide emissions. Now this is assuming that it's going into a typical data center. Most data centers that, uh, let's say the top cloud providers, are more efficient than this. And this is again why at Google we have this commitment to be carbon dioxide net zero by 2030. But uh, relative to the cost of the server, just building it and deploying it, uh, etc., can be quite expensive. Okay, so that's on the one side. Now we have to make sure that we actually are making good use of the watts, the power that we are provisioning. So just looking at it at the top level, left-hand graph considers the uh, throughput that we might have for a training job as a function of the peak watts that it, that job consumes. Okay. What you can see here is that the throughput might rise close to linearly as we increase the power available to it, but it tails off. This is typical. On the one hand, you might consider, well, I want the most uh, throughput possible, so I should keep pushing to the right. On the other hand, if you're really focused on maximizing your throughput per watt across your infrastructure, you would stop at some point. You would stop at that point of diminishing returns, highlight with a dashed line, or somewhere around there. On the right-hand side, we consider what it would mean to provision the right amount of watts. Should we actually provision across, let's say, 10,000 chips, 20,000 chips, whatever the number winds up being, for the maximum amount that all those chips can simultaneously consume? And again, what we can see is that many jobs, the percent of total jobs on the y-axis, don't necessarily need to go all the way to the far right hand in terms of supporting the peak watts per chip times the total number of chips that you might deploy. So lots of opportunity for um, optimization. And uh, let me show you a simple example, maybe a cartoon example of how this plays out. But what I'd love for uh, you all, for all of us to be thinking about is, what support would we put into our chips? to be able to really drive these kinds of optimizations that I'm going to highlight here as a very simple example. Because today, much of this is somewhere between hard and impossible. Okay. So in this very simple example, we have uh, two jobs, right? Job one and job two. Job one is compute bound. Job two might be memory bound. Perhaps it's network bound. Uh, what you can see here, though, is that because job two in blue is memory bound, actually it's voltage and its amperage winds up varying widely. Right? It jumps up and down as it goes through a compute bound phase and perhaps a memory bound phase. Job one is more steady. Right? Uh, job one also has more room relative to the chip vmin right? because it's more steadily operating. What you can imagine is if we could understand the job's throughput characteristics as well as its real-time power characteristics, we could drive some optimizations. We could increase the current for job one the compute bound job. Right? Uh, we could actually reduce its voltage target. Similarly, we could uh, consider the fact that job two is memory bound and reduce its current, reducing its frequency. Right? 
without working through all the details, we could get to a place where we could increase, actually, the performance of uh, job one by 10%, while decreasing the power consumption of uh, job two by 20%. These kinds of optimizations wind up being rather material and perhaps even larger than what's uh, highlighted here when accounting for many, many jobs multiplexed on a large amount of computing infrastructure. Today, the visibility necessary to carry out these kinds of optimizations is missing or very hard to get at. Once you have this kind of information available, you can actually drive uh, higher level systems scheduling optimizations as well. We found that these kinds of systems scheduling optimizations can, be, uh, can result in integer factors improvements in overall efficiency. Once again, this is a cartoon example, but what you can imagine is that we can have a cell-wide control plane, which is available again at uh, most cloud providers, that can consider high power jobs that shouldn't all be, in this example, scheduled on the same bus bar. Without going into details, a data center consists of some number of bus bars, each with a fixed power capacity. Let's say there's 15, 20, 30 of these. You, if you have visibility into the power consumption characteristics of your jobs, you can take your high power job and spread them across bus bars, mixing them with lower power jobs on the same bus bars to actually get a, an appropriate mix going from potentially an infeasible scheduling to a feasible scheduling of your workloads. So again, another example to uh, perhaps drive home how this might uh, work in practice. Simplified, four bus bars, five racks per bus bar, 20 total racks in a data center. Consider we have one synchronous 16 rack job that's running across these four bus bars, and then four individual one rack jobs in blue also spread across these bus bars. Imagine for a moment that we have a power failure event. At scale, these happen regularly. This power failure event reduces the power available to bus bar 4 by 40%. That means that all the jobs in bus dot 4 must be throttled by that same 40%. Right? They can no longer run at full power. Now, the yellow is synchronous. That means that it has to run at the speed of essentially the slowest components. That means the other 12 out of the 16 also are going to run with 40% throttling in effect, whether or not we uh, throttle the power or not. Well, what could we do to react? Well, one thing we can do to react to maximize system throughput is actually pause one of the blue jobs. This would allow us to reduce the throttling of the yellow to 28%, similarly improving the performance of the other 12 nodes in the same job. Now, another thing we could do is we could move one of the blue jobs, pausing it temporarily, and shift the compute so that we only have three racks worth of computes on the affected bus bar, and five racks of computes on the yellow. This allows us to move to 5% throttling. And that 5% throttling is now what has to be applied to all the yellow jobs. In fact, this then allows us to shift some power to the two remaining blue single rack jobs to move them to 1.3x relative to the 1.0x that they were at. Now, if this were a rare event, perhaps we wouldn't bother. But managing po uh, power and reliability, which I'll highlight in a second, is a really important part of the work on a regular basis. So what, what's important to note is when you're talking about hundreds, thousands, and perhaps more of individual uh, processing elements working synchronously on a single job, if one of them slows down or stops, it can affect the entire computation dramatically. So reliability is going to become increasingly uh, important. So what I also want to highlight for the community here is an increasing challenge that we have around silent data corruption. Uh, we've published actually an external paper uh, recently called Cores That Don't Count that highlights this issue. But essentially what it comes down to is that as these chips, and it's not uh, um, isolated to a single kind of chip, CPUs, uh, are impacted as well. This is broadly seen across the community. We are getting to a place where certain compute elements non-deterministically produce incorrect results. And it's either impossible or very difficult to catch this, right? Uh, bottom line is every once in a while, a chip might say one plus one equals three. Now, this is especially problematic when you're running 
uh, uh, synchronous stochastic gradient descent across thousands of uh, elements. Remember the high bandwidth interconnect, low latency interconnect, that's spreading the results of computation across thousands of nodes. If one of them periodically says 1 plus 1 equals 3, it will quickly spread to all of them, corrupting the computation at scale. So this becomes, while it's a serious problem for single node computation, it's a multiplicatively worse problem, dramatically worse problem, as you scale up to hundreds or thousands of elements. So uh, we've been uh, working hard to essentially capture these issues in real time and react to them. So without going again into the details, this shows uh, monitoring that we have in place that captures the gradient norm, the change in the gradient as we do this uh, stochastic gradient descent across these very large jobs across time. And periodically what we can see is a spike in the norm that um, can be a result of silent data corruption. Unfortunately, you can have the same spike through uh, normal operation of the computation as well. So you can see similar things with no silent data corruption. The question is, can you rerun that computation when you have a suspected SDC event, silent data corruption event, and see if you got the same results? In this particular example, we've rerun a, a suspected SDC case and got the exact same results repeatedly. And so we were able to conclude that was a normal part of the job. What we've had to do, though, is actually set up our infrastructure so that a, we rapidly checkpoint our co computation, and rapid checkpointing plus support for rapid checkpointing is key. Because we can't assume that we will be able to have all, let's say, 4,096 chips available for days and weeks and perhaps months. Periodically, we have to capture the state of the entire computation reliably, ready to restart. We might need to restart because there's a failure, and certainly these chips and systems uh, fail with regularity. We might have to restart because of silent data corruption. Uh, without going into the details here, we have relatively sophisticated mechanisms where we can actually rerun computation on some hot spares to validate whether or not we've had silent data corruption, remove the affected uh, elements from the computation using our optical circuit switching, and restart from the last known good checkpoint. But still, all this adds up. All this adds up to lost good put that is not captured by system headline chip performance. And so we might give up, again as a community, lower headline performance if our computing elements failed less often. And or if we had mechanisms to more reliably detect when they're failing silently. Okay, so with that I'm going to hand it back to Jeff to tell us about some uh, important work that will allow us to get to our destinations more quickly. All right. Thanks very much, Amin. Uh, you know, I think one of the things we feel is really important is that we must be able to iterate much faster when delivering specialized hardware. You know, I mentioned that the field of machine learning is moving extremely quickly, and that's somewhat incompatible with timelines where you're designing a chip today, and then you're trying to look out a few years from when that chip, uh, you know, is just an idea until it actually first gets deployed and then must remain live in a production setting for many years. And so now all of a sudden you're trying to forecast where is machine learning going in order to build hardware that is sort of appropriately uh, accelerating the kinds of computations you imagine people want to run three to seven years from now. And this is kind of depicted on this timeline where, you know, right now the industry best practice from, you know, having a cool hardware chip accelerator idea to actually getting it in real production is about three years. Um, and, you know, there's, you know, many different phases of this. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the chip design and implementation of the chip design phase, uh, where a lot of the time is. And I think we can probably accelerate this quite a lot. And one of the ways we can do this is applying machine learning to different phases of this chip design uh, process. So let's talk about a few of these. What if we got, what if we hypothetically could design a custom chip with a few people in a few weeks. I think this is an aspirational goal, but it's a good one to keep in mind as we think about what phases of chip design could we use automated uh, machine learning methods to help accelerate um, in conjunction with human, human designers uh, in order to really uh, make progress. Okay, so one area is there's a lot of architectural exploration that happens in this six to 12 month phase of what kind of overall high level design parameters uh, makes sense. And 
One of the things we think you can do is use machine learning to automatically do the, some of this architectural exploration and synthesis of the high level to the low level design. Um, so using ML, we can extend the design space exploration uh, that is done. Typically, hardware design space choices, you know, people uh, typically run lots of simulations and compare things uh, and look, evaluate, you know, how large should I make the L1 cache? How much memory bandwidth should I have? How large should I make an L2 cache? Uh, how many, um, you know, uh, DRAM channels should I have? And so on. Um, and that's a pretty big search space in and of itself. But often that also means that people are, that uh, computer architects are not necessarily considering the compiler transformations that would make most effective use of these potential design choices because it's hard to model compiler design choices. And so one of the things we've been exploring is how can you have an automated machine learning system that explores both design choices and compiler high-level high level compiler choices about how computations get mapped onto that hardware in order to sort of consider this broader set of things of how would it actually perform if you had a compiler tuned for the, uh, uh, the sort of hardware choices you made. And so what I show in this graph is there's a blue baseline TPU V3-like system, but simulated to be on a more modern process. And in red, this is the compiler space exploration portion of this work, where we don't make any hardware changes to TPU V3 hypothetical system, but we're able to sort of uh, imagine different kinds of compiler optimizations that could map things more efficiently onto the hardware. And each of the x-axes here is a different kind of machine learning model. Efficient net B0 through B7 are image models, as is ResNet and the OCR models, and the BERT models are transformer-based language models. And so what you see is the red gives you pretty interesting performance improvements over the blue, but the green is when you are able to customize the accelerator uh, design parameters, the hardware design parameters, plus the compiler for a particular single model. So if you wanted to build a model, build hardware that was really good at running efficient at B1, you could get quite substantial performance per uh, TDP, uh, per total power uh, improvements. Uh, and that's true across the board for all these different models. If you built mo uh, hardware accelerated for that particular model structure, a uh, particular model, you would be able to build something more, more specialized, but higher performance for that workload. Um, similarly, you can back off a little bit to uh, I would like to accelerate a mix of workloads. So if you customize the design space search to optimize for a blend of performance of all five of these models, uh, then you actually get the yellow bar. And the yellow bar is still interestingly, interestingly enough above the, uh, the blue and the red bars that we think this makes sense uh, to sort of really start thinking about uh, designing customized hardware for mixes of workloads that you think are are potentially useful to accelerate. Um, another area that takes a long time in chip design is verification. Uh, so can we speed up verification by learning to automatically generate test coverage with a small set of human authored tests? Um, and it turns out you can. I'm not going to talk about it, but you should uh, consult the learning semantic representations to verify hardware designs paper that appeared in uh, the NeurIPS 2021 paper, uh, conference. Um, and then another area is learning to quickly generate high quality placement and routing decisions. And this is an area we've done a bit of work in. You know, can we get a reinforcement learning agent to play everyone's favorite game, the game of ASIC chip layout? Um, and you know, reinforcement learning has been shown to have really good results in things with very sort of concrete, uh, well-defined rewards. So playing games like chess and go, where you know you either won or you lost after making a sequence of moves. Um, turns out chip placement can be modeled in the same kind of framework where you have a blend of metrics you're trying to optimize for, you know, uh, power, wire length, uh, and chip area. And uh, the number of states in this space is much larger than Go, but it is possible to use reinforcement learning to get good solutions to uh, placement and routing and to do so quite quickly. And so here's the results of applying, oops, here's the results of applying this to a single TPU design block. The white blurred areas are macros, memory typically, uh, and the green areas are standard cell logic. And this is the design done by a human expert uh, uh, placement and routing 
uh, person, and the time taken was you know six to eight person weeks with a total wire length of of 57.07. The machine learning placement method uh, basically took 24 hours of computation um, and was able to find something with a shorter uh, total wire length. Uh, and you can see it kind of did a more organic job of placing the, the memory around the standard cell logic in order to minimize that, to make that wire length shorter. Um, and if you apply this to all the different uh, blocks on a, a design, uh, we've actually applied it to 37 blocks of a recent TPU chip design and found that 26 of the 37 blocks were better quality of result than the placement generated by human experts. Seven of 37 were equal and four of 37 blocks were worse quality of result. And we've learned interesting lessons from those blocks so that we can improve the overall automated system. So we think that's a pretty exciting thing because it enables you to very quickly adapt to higher up, upstream changes in the chip design. So when you've got placement and routing done in a fairly slow way, you can't afford to make any changes uh, in the system uh, upstream, like change the design radically. But if you can redo the, the sort of placement in 24 hours, then that's a pretty reasonable thing to be able to do. Okay, uh, note that even if we get much more rapid turnaround on designing a chip, uh, we can run this on system emulators, get much higher quality feedback, and it doesn't need to be the case that every automated design and implementation actually gets sent down the pipeline to a fab. It might be that we just learn lessons from that and iterate and treat this as part of the iterative cycle of designing an actual chip. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to go quickly on this, but we think there's major opportunities to shrink the time from when a chip comes back to actually getting running in production. So one is have the software running on emulation at tape out, um, you know, running workloads across thousands of chips in one month after it comes back from the fab, uh, being able to sort of uh, do better testing and isolation for SDCs and so on. Uh, we think this is all really important and that 12 months can probably be shrunk pretty significantly. Okay, in conclusion, uh, first, ML capabilities are improving rapidly, and it's going to bring fundamental changes to the way we, the computing community, do things. Uh, it's an increasingly large portion of what we want computations to look like in the world uh, and the kinds of computations we're going to want to run. Um, ML models are increasingly dynamic and evolving structures, not static dense models. Uh, we, focus, we should focus on system good put, not chip headline performance. Power, CO2E efficiency, and SDCs are really important to accurately measure and to improve. And shorter timelines for designing and deploying new hardware is really essential to rapidly adapt to the changing ML landscape. Uh, we think ML automation of the, the design process can help. And with that, thank you very much. We are done. Thank you, Amin. Great to jointly present with you. And we'll take questions. Thank you, Jeff and Amin. So we have two mics for uh, questions and audience, and then we'll take, maybe we'll start one from Slack while people lining up for the light mics. Yeah, we have a couple of questions on interconnects. The first question is from Manu Gulati Qualcomm. You spoke about using optics for the transporter connectivity between TPUs for scaling. What about optics for the actual computation? If optics can uh, drastically increase the throughput of compute, you need fewer chips for the same compute, which is beneficial for the performance and energy. Uh, the second question is from Rajesh Jagannath, also on Interconnects from Meta. Uh, it was mentioned that there will be a trend away from multiple models to single models that will handle different workloads and that Interconnects will assume more significance. Do the trends and changes in interconnects refer to inter-accelerator networks or on-chip networks? What are some of the new trends on uh, network on chips we are seeing? Yeah, two, uh, two, two great questions. I'll, uh, can people hear me? Yeah. Is this live? OK, sounds like they activated. Great. Um, on the first question, um, we have not yet uh, found that breakthrough. It, it may come in terms of optical uh, on-chip. Uh, but uh, absolutely believe that uh, this is an important area for us to continue yeah. to explore together. Likely, it will come over the coming years. Um, on the second one, I don't know if Jeff uh, wants to uh, jump in, but the interconnect that we have been talking about has been between chips, uh, not on chip. 
uh, again, uh, where optical on-chip might become useful, uh, absolutely can happen. Th those uh, crossover points haven't yet taken place. Jeff, I don't know if you want to add anything for either one of those. A few more questions. Yeah. I don't know. Hi. I'm uh, Todd B. from Fritter. Um, I, I have a long question for you, Amin, but you'll be here. I'll talk to you in person. Um, Jeff, uh, have you had one of your models take a professional exam and did it pass? Um, you, uh, on the Met Palm slide, I showed uh, results of the model sort of achieving a passing score. The Med Palm 1 model achieved sort of a uh, 67, and then the, uh, the Med Palm 2 model achieved an 80. Okay, but it might have to go somewhere. So, okay, let's take yeah. one from the left. Um, thank you. Uh, Jenny uh, at Future Way Technologies. Uh, quick question to follow up, uh, uh, Jeff, your work on ML for EDA. Just wonder, going forward, uh, what are the main challenges you think? Is it more in terms of data availability from the currently mostly proprietary uh, EDA data? Or is it more, uh, for example, physics aware or human expert in the loop, uh, uh, machine learning models, or somewhere else. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think the, there's so much potential here. Uh, I think we've, we and others in the research community have done really good work on pieces of kind of much more automated systems for different, uh, you know, important phases of the chip design process. Uh, but we have not yet put all those pieces together into a single, much more automated workflow with you know, a few humans in the loop really figuring out how to design uh, things from scratch into something we could, that you can actually send to the fab. So I think, um, you know, I'm bullish on, you know, being able to take a restricted class of, of chips you might want to design. Let's say you want to design chips for accelerating neural network inference, uh, because that's a, a much more narrow problem than design any old chip in the world. And then seeing what can happen if you try to automate uh, as much of that as, you, as possible as kind of a stepping stone to more general automation. Okay, but let's do one last question on the right over there. Very interesting talk. Thanks. This is Pradeep from KLA. Um, I have a question about the impact of liquid cooling. And I don't know if you guys look at the emotion cooling also, especially on the TCO side of the equations. Perf per TCO, the impact on perf is clear. What about TCO and reliability when you leverage liquid cooling? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, great question. So uh, as I mentioned, we account for perf TCO and uh, overall reliability is uh, improved. Uh, and uh, while it does incur additional costs, it uh, is uh, in our evaluations more than made up for in terms of increased performance and uh, improved reliability end to end. So uh, for us, this has um, been uh, easily validated over multiple generations as the right direction. We see more of it happening, uh, not less. Cool, thanks. One, one thing I would add on to that, though, if you remember the timeline of deployment time from design to production, um, liquid cooling adds some complexity in how you deploy the actual systems. And so you now need like teams of plumbers, you know, designing the, and installing the liquid cooling system, which can you know, be a lot more complex to do than air cooling. Yeah, we uh, one of the challenges which uh, we have accounted for is we've had to essentially transform our physical footprint uh, to uh, be able to accommodate liquid cooling uh, really across the world. So that, that has been a challenge, but one that we're many years into at this point. Yeah. Thanks. Let's thank the speakers once more time. Thank you.